This is Idle Insiders with your host, Bennett Shear. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Idle Insiders. I'm your host, Bennett Shear, and I am very excited to welcome Miles Siggins to the show. How's it going, Miles? Good, thanks. How are you, Bennett? I'm excited to be here. I am great. Tell me the beginning of your story as a designer, image consultant, branding. I think the big question is, how and when did you fall in love with fashion in your life? How did I? Well, when I was 11 years old, the Sex Pistols hit the UK and I just loved like, so I I was really like fascinated by Sid Vicious. So I just started kind of like having an interest in clothes and I, I got really into music and music and fashion, I think have always been hand in hand. I think fashion leads music quite a lot of the time. So it just kind of started from there. And then I went from, you know, that to... I went through pretty much every phase of music from heavy metal to new romantic to sort of, you know, goth. And I dressed accordingly all the way through. It's interesting that you say that because fashion and music and the sort of collision and fact that it had to do with the band, American Idol, having them play so much emphasis on these singers dressing the right way, it must have been full circle for you to get that gig, knowing that the beginning of your interest was a band and sort of how they dressed, right? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd already... I'd already been doing music videos and working with quite a few musicians by then so you know kind of it was it was a different it was a natural progression as to for my actual career because you know sort of and it was just like a much better direction for my career as well because you know music videos and things are kind of hard to do and you're dealing with different so many different personalities constantly to go into a, a tv studio every week and then to kind of help build somebody's image was like kind of really interesting to me you know american idol is all about giving contestants their big break. So I love to ask, uh, what was your first big break in the industry? Well, I used to own a clothing company called Stussy in England, which is like a big kind of surf skate brand. And it was, it's an American company. I had the European rights and, you know, I used to own it in England. Um, so I'd come over to the States a lot on business. And then I decided to move to LA and went to the bank one day. And I thought I had, you know, $10,000 left in the bank and I had a hundred bucks. And my roommate at the time, this girl Kim Bowen, was an English girl who was a big stylist. And she was, she was Janet Jackson and George Michael's stylist at the time, who were both kind of in 94, still kind of pretty big. So she just said, you know, why don't you start assisting me? So I started assisting her. And then I started assisting another girl for, and doing a lot of Vanity Fair stuff. And then I just started getting my own shoots. And it just kind of went from there. And then with American Idol... My wife and I used to live down in downtown LA and one of our neighbors was a producer on season one. And she just came up to me one day and said, you know, they're looking for a stylist for season two for this show, American Idol. Are you interested? And I said, well, yeah, I mean, I haven't heard, I didn't, I hadn't known about it or heard about it at the time. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll meet with them. And um, the two executive producers at the time, Ken Warwick and Nigel Lithgow, um, it turned out we were all born within five miles of each other which is why i think i got the gig and not nothing to do with the fact that i'd work with people like aretha franklin and denzel washington and whoever anything in particular that you learn you list those names working with musicians right away i gotta imagine that it kind of gives you that perspective to work with aspiring singers yeah i mean my whole thing or in everything i've done styling wise is the subject the person you're styling has to be comfortable with what they're wearing because if they're not comfortable then it's going to show in the pictures or in the way they move or everything to me is about people feeling comfortable in what they're wearing absolutely uh going from season one to season two the show had obviously exploded and i think even you know nigel and ken have talked about everybody that started on that show talked about how it was this big surprise. It was a big hit in the UK. Everybody wondered what was going to happen. So you were coming into something that was so established, obviously having worked with so many of the greats. What were your thoughts? It was this big TV phenomenon and everybody, I feel like coming into it must have been pretty excited just to be a part of something like that. Yeah. I mean, I I don't think like season one wasn't, I mean, obviously Kelly Clarkson, but season one wasn't the pinnacle of it i think kind of over the next kind of few years it really really grew and became a beast um so season two was kind of a little bit tamer which was a nice kind of little baptism for me so you know it wasn't too crazy but it was a lot of work i mean my wife was my assisted me on it and we worked that we did 18 seven days a week for 18 weeks wow so i mean which was great for the bank balance but you know we (laughs) we didn't get a chance to spend anything but it was exhausting because we were doing kind of 
we were doing the show. And at that time, I used to take, we used to take all the contestants shopping, you know, because my whole thing was like, they, I, I, my whole thing with Idol was they needed to have an input in what they, in their image. So, and, you know, I was just there to kind of guide them and say, yeah, that looks great. That looks terrible. Um, you know, if you want to take a risk, then great, let's do it. It was you know, a lot of work, but it was, it was really, really fun. That first season you were on alone, you've got Ruben and Clay. Um, yeah. We got next season, Jennifer Hudson. I mean, Carrie Underwood, a- any memories in particular of just going shopping and seeing something and thinking, wow, this contestant, this outfit. I'm still in touch with the Ruben and Clay. And we, you know, we're kind of still really good friends. Um, but Ruben, we used to go to a place called Fox Hills Mall. It was like he, I walked in with the Pope. People were just kind of all over him. And I kind of just said to those guys very early on, I said, you know, you've got to get out there and you've got to kind of like shake hands and kiss babies because, you know, if you're nice to these people, then they're the ones who are going to vote for you. But so that was really, really, you know, that was a lot of fun. Um, Going shopping with Clay, we did, you know, we had one outfit, which was, I was chastised so badly for it and so was Clay, which was a red leather jacket. Which I thought was great on him, but you know, kind of, I guess it was maybe a little too early until he kind of found his comfort zone. Taylor Hicks was very, very studied. He was, he was, a, he was a really good guy. He was really fun to shot with because he all he wanted, he wanted tailoring. And I mean, I don't know if anyone's told you, you know, basically, I had a budget every week, or the contestants had a budget every week to shop with, but they also got paid to be on the show. So I always said to them, "Look, this is your one chance." So, you know, you've got your food and accommodation taken care of. If you can afford it, then spend some of your money on clothing as well, because especially on the, back then it was a two show uh, week. So, you know, we did the performance one day and the voting the next day. So I'd say spend money on the performance outfit. And then, and Taylor was like that. Taylor would buy, spend, you know, a thousand bucks of his own money every week on a suit. And, you know, plus I'd put in whatever we had for the budget. One thing with Idol was that, because it was so huge, we used to get given so many clothes. I mean, literally every label was kind of sending us boxes and boxes of clothes all the time. But at one point, some serious jewelry companies got involved. And I remember going down to an office in Venice in California and walking out with a million dollars worth of diamonds in a brown paper bag and using them on a couple of contestants. Um One of the contestants who shall remain nameless, um, but whose mum was... She was she was younger and her mum was kind of basically a stage mum, an awful woman. Um, they walked off with a bunch of the diamonds and it took a little bit of sleuthing to find them. So. Well, I mean, if you're listening and not watching, you'll see my jaw drop, but <laughs> my, won't, or won't see my jaw drop. That's. Um, yeah, that, that was kind of crazy because it was literally, I mean, like for a day or so, we were like, where the hell are they? I mean, literally, we did not know where they were. And it was, you know, a quarter of a million bucks for the diamonds that are missing. That is a perfect example of the show within a show that we didn't get to see at home because it's like you could yeah. totally make an hour of like the mystery drama that is just the huge stakes of what happens if we don't find it and the character of the stage mom. And Oh, yeah. And it's, I kind of, it's, I mean, at the time, it was a really, really awkward situation. I mean, and, you know, this person and this girl and her mum made this show kind of miserable for a lot of people or working on the show miserable for a lot of people I mean I've seen the contestant since and she's just going to come right out of him and become like such a nice person but back in those days oh it was it was tough and then to do that on top and then deny it and then we suddenly you know we finally managed to track everything down and get it back but hmm. so people yeah. can change but we also cannot forget what happened when you steal that's a lot of jewelry. that's a lot of money's worth yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a little nerve-wracking and you know it reminds me of another stylist who whose diamonds went missing she told the company that the dog ate the diamonds and they were like you'll just have to sit at the other end then won't you? <laughs> oh my gosh how by the way so um how many seasons did you style the contestants? Because you're obviously still working with Ryan. How many seasons were you with the kids? So I styled all of the contestants and Ryan for the first five seasons I was on. So from two through seven. Okay. And then for seven through 12 was just the guys and Ryan. Gotcha. And then since then it's been Ryan. I remember, and I've heard you talk about, read you talk about this outfit. 
Danny Goki in season eight wearing all white and Simon saying, you look like you're in the polar expedition. <laughs> well, that, this, was that during the finale or was that during the season? Well, he made top three. So it was right. I don't know what week it was, but I think it was, you know, he, he got cut right met, before the final. Right. Yeah. I mean, Danny, Danny was one who had, he had very, very definite ideas of how he wanted to portray himself. Mm hmm. Um, and I could guide him so much, but he was kind of, he knew what he wanted. Right. Which is a good, you know, it, to me is a good thing. I mean, it's some people that kind of backfires on, and I think it backfired on him in that, on that occasion. But when, I mean, every season when Ken and Nigel were at the helm during the finale, we'd always have an all white outfit for everybody, which the lighting guys hated. We'd have a sea of white on the stage and it was just so... But also in season eight, one of one of your iconic outfits that you put together, Adam Lambert in the finale when he got to perform oh, with, with Kiss. The Queen. Oh, with Kiss, yeah. Talk oh, about yeah. that because that was iconic. No, I mean Adam. I mean the whole season, Adam was just Adam was probably the best person you could hope to work with because he came to you with definite ideas and just let you kind of run with his ideas, and then it was a, it was a total collaboration. Um. And yeah, so for like, you know, the finale, we had that kind of the huge cage, kind of what, one of Adam's ideas, we found a pair of silver duck Martins that were um, designed by a designer called Ref Simons. And they were in Europe. Um, and luckily, a friend of mine did the PR for them in England. So he kind of, I called him and he arranged to have the boots sent over. So they sent the boots over day before the show. Um, dress rehearsal, pull the boots out of the box, and there's two left feet. Wow. So I called my friend and explained the situation. He said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Um, the next day, the boot arrived, and I was like, how the hell did you do that? Basically, they sent the boot over on a private plane on its own with a security guard because it was in Ralph Simon's apartment in Amsterdam. I mean, that's when the show went, it was just most powerful, I think. You know, Adam's gone on to be a huge star, both in his own right and with Queen. So it's, you know, I think a lot of people saw the potential in him. But what an opportunity. I mean, can you, I can't imagine, you can tell us, just for a guy like Adam to get the opportunity to work with you and just to have that experience of week after week working with the best of the best, in style because you know to be such an entertaining performer and to have such an identity already and then throwing fashion into the mix i cannot imagine what kind of an experience that was for him to get to do idol and to get to those live shows i think it was the same for both of us i think we both kind of fed off each other and just like really enjoyed like the trying to change it up every week and surprise people yeah i mean he did some amazing things like when he did um tears for fears um mad world oh yeah and just like a super simple kind of beige suede jacket and jeans. But it was like, I mean, it was the jacket was amazing. I think Idol has always been about a transformation. So it's important to really dissect style when it comes to that, that specific element. You know, we think about their voice and their performances and maybe even their personality, but how their looks can change because, I mean, image is such a big part of who an artist is. So I, I feel that it it's you know, it's critical and the work that you did. And I know you have hair and makeup, but everything coming together, that's fascinating, right? To sort of go with them, especially back in those days when the live shows were you know, sometimes 10, 12 weeks. And, you know, you're really going on that journey with them and we're seeing it. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, back in those days, it was all about a transformation. You know, we kind of, we didn't kind of, it wasn't sort of the first day they were on stage, they looked like stars. It was like a gradual yeah. process. And we, I, you know, I did that on purpose because I thought the public would enjoy that more. Yeah. They could kind of, it became more aspirational instead of kind of like sticking them straight in something kind of like crazy that, and also it was going back to the comfort factor as well. I don't think they'd have been comfortable straight away, especially in those days, because Idol was, you know, it was kind of the beginning of the whole kind of talent show genre, really, you know, the competition genre anyway, for talent. Nowadays, it's very different because of, you know, The Voice and whatever other shows, because, you know, everyone goes on and they look like stars straight away. I thought it was really important to do it gradually. It's important that we really get to know the people behind the scenes. We often hear people say, my team. Well, who are the team members? It's an honor to meet you for that reason, just to know everything that you've done to work with so many people. And not even to mention other shows we haven't talked about and different 
celebrities. Yeah, I mean, I know you say team, but I never really had a team. It was always me and one assistant. Mm -hmm. And then I had an intern as well sometimes. And that was part of the finale then we had. Then I had like an extra two or three people. Mm -hmm. Now, when I go to the Idol wardrobe room, Laurie, who I know really well, who does, is the costume designer for the contestants, she's got a team of like 10 people. Wow. Wow, I would have loved that back then. <laughs> but it's a very different show now to what it, to, it was, you know, when I was doing the contestants. So. so you were originally brought on to just work with the contestants and then the work with Ryan came from that or am I understanding? No, I mean, I, well, I mean, I was brought on, I was just brought on to do the show. So, I, you know, I started with Ryan on season two uh -huh. as well. Tell me about meeting Ryan and working with him. And obviously the relationship's grown. We have Idol and he's done so many other things. Again, it's like season two, I kind of went into the whole thing blind. I didn't know that it was going to be the juggernaut that it was. And Ryan was going to be the star that he was. I mean, back then he was, you know, again, it's like he was only just really starting out. You know, he was known on the radio, but apart from that, he hadn't really done much television. He'd done gladiators and a couple of other little things. I wanted to show you in, in my research, uh, it, Ryan Seacrest came up and on, randomly on his YouTube channel, there's an interview with Nicki Minaj and it was sometime around Christmas time of 2014, right? Sounds very random, but he has stockings. So he's got all of his engineers, he's got his co-host and I saw Miles. So I, I wanted to point that out to you because again, yeah. we talk about the team and he has his team, but you know, it just goes to show with everything that he's done. I mean, I've seen so many videos on his channel behind the scenes for Idol and other projects where there you are helping him. And it's just so cool to see everything that goes into shows and everything they're working on. It's amazing. I've worked with Ryan for 20 years now. I think from his point of view, he knows I can do my job and it's something he doesn't have to worry about. We've had some kind of interesting looks over the years, but that's kind of the way fashion was back, you know, back in the day. And we've kind of honed it down to kind of a certain thing as time's gone on. He's become, you know, the ultimate TV host. He's so good at what he does. I went to two of the live tapings this year seeing him it, the first time that i got to see that show live watching him work was a master class in television it was insane just to see you know and i also didn't realize how quickly they go from okay everybody's just backstage all right cameras are up shows live watching it at home of course so much happens backstage you're obviously involved in that but we're just in the audience they're warming us up they're playing music got josh randall who's the warm-up host and all of a sudden all right guys we're on live tv and there he is in that beautiful suit, cameras, lights, he's reading the lines. And then throughout the show, he just navigates everything so seamlessly. Commercial yeah, breaks. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's like beautiful he's, to see. <laughs> yeah, he's really, like I say, he's like the best of the best, I think. You know, he really is, you know, amazing at what he does. And he can kind of direct the show as well. Things that you don't see backstage. Sometimes, you know, we're running think the show is running long so he has to kind of like pull things in a little bit to kind of finish on time because with live tv you only have a certain amount of time to finish the show and sometimes the show's under so it could be like you know three minutes under where he has to kind of like draw the draw it out and kind of so he kind of he has little tricks up his sleeve that he utilizes to kind of either shorten the show or lengthen it depending on what they need is it on the day of okay this jacket with this shirt i normally have two or three options to show him and then we just kind of decide which one. But like, you know, since he's, you know, with the whole suit thing, it makes it obviously makes it a lot easier. So it's just kind of like changing a shirt or a tie or a pocket square. And then, you know, the next week I show the other two and he's like, great, let's do that one. I'm very flattered because he seems to trust me in what I do with him, which is nice. And, you know, I have a couple of other clients like that as well who are kind of like, you know, just say, whatever you want to do, you do it. You've worked with a lot of other television clients. I mean, I imagine that working with Nigel on So You Think You Can Dance came from Idol and you've done... Yeah. Shark Tank, do you want to talk about some of those other shows and how that transition went? Yeah, I mean, well, what are the shows? I mean, oh, um, Rockstar Supernova. Did you know mm. that about that one? Another singing show, music show? Yeah, it was, um, they did Rockstar In Excess, where they found a new lead singer for In Excess. And then they did Rockstar Supernova, which was a metal band with Tommy Lee, um, Gilby Clark and Jason Newstead. Um, and they were looking for a singer. And that was, a, that was a lot of fun to work on because it was, you know, basically rockers and we would, I was just given free reign to put them in whatever I wanted. Wow. So we put, you know, like Lucas, who went we put him in like a priest self at one day and just like, okay, I mean, we did some really crazy stuff and that was a lot of fun. And then, yeah, I mean, I've kind of tend to, grow, I've, uh, over my kind of career, I've tended to become the suit guy for TV. So, you know, if you need a host putting in a suit, I tend to, I've, kind of become that person which i like to know i know a lot about tailoring 
because I started with uh, an English designer called Paul Smith when I was 18, who was primarily, he was primarily a tailor back then. So, um, yeah, I know my way around a suit. So, yeah, I mean, Shark Tank. Um, it's. I mean, I've been lucky. Everything I've done has been word of mouth. So a producer I worked with on American Idol moved over to Shark Tank and then they recommended me and I met with everybody. And they were like, great, let's do it. And then so, you know, the sharks, they would just come in with a suitcase full of clothes and that's it, let's do that, that and that. Can you tell me a little bit more about working with Paul? Because at such a young age, it sounds like that was a mentoring experience. I think we all we all crave that. We're all very lucky when we have the opportunity to be mentored. And especially those of us wanting to break into the industry, it's always sort of going back and thinking about those early days, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, for me, and I mean, you know, again, it's like, you know, I, since, you know, I was 11 years old with the Sex Pistols, I was kind of really into fashion. And then, you know, I had a summer job when I finished school before I was supposed to go to, you know, further education. And I just got paid really well. And I started, I lived in a little village called Castle Donington in the middle of England, which was not far from Nottingham. And we had every fr- had Friday afternoons off. I got and get on the bus every Friday afternoon and go and spend every penny at Paul Smith. And then he was in there one day and he said, oh, I've heard about you. Why don't you come and work for me? So I went to work for Paul Smith and kind of everything kind of snowballed from there. Mm. It sounds like a cliche because it was like, oh, my God, but what was your what were the emotions? Do you remember that specific? What was the reaction yeah, when you heard Smith, when, when you said, come work for me? You're probably like, oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, it, and I went from making, you know, back then 400 pounds a week to my first paycheck with Paul Smith was 51 pounds, 74 so I took a massive drop and started, but I was, you know, doing something that I loved. And, you know, Paul was, he's not, he was not the huge designer he is now. You know, he had like maybe three stores back then. And now he's got, you know, 350 stores. I got on really well with him. I just worked on the shop floor. I got to meet a lot of people through that as well. Honestly, I sort of went into this conversation thinking, I don't know much about fashion. It makes me almost nervous. Like, what kind of questions do I ask? And I don't know everything about different types of clothes and designers. But I find myself very interested in wanting to know more because whatever you're trying to achieve, looking your best is pretty important. With every idol contestant I worked with, the first thing I said to them, the first sense anyone gets of you when you walk out on stage is visual. So you've got to make sure that you're presenting yourself the way you want the world to see you. I hate to use the word fashion now because I don't understand fashion anymore. Mm. It's kind of like it's morphed into this huge kind of like thing. I much prefer style. And, you know, I'm not really into this kind of huge baggy oversized kind of look. I much prefer prefer a kind of slim tailor look to kind of show you at your best. Not tight, but slim. And maybe that's just my age. I don't know. My son's 17 and he's wearing drop crotch Rick Owen shorts and super tight Rick Owens. he's really into, you know rick owens who's a kind of a, an avant-garde designer i guess so who i actually know from years ago but um yeah so he's kind of the stuff that he wears i'm like wow okay i've always loved the suits i've always just tried to wear suits as much as i can yeah me too i mean i all up until like the pandemic i wore a suit on every show i worked on i wore a suit every show day so, you know, I've got quite a good collection of suits. I love wearing a suit. It's, you know, kind of like a piece of armor. You put it on and you don't have to think. So, you know, you, yeah, you can just stick a suit on. You can wear it with, depend on, depending on the suit, you can wear it with a T-shirt. You can wear it with a, just a shirt, a polo shirt, shirt and tie, shoes, sneakers. You know, so you can change the suit up quite a lot. Do you think the pandemic and sort of getting out of that, we're obviously not out of the pandemic, as you know, but... No, it's kind of, yeah, coming back. Coming back <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but just as far as things getting back to normal sort of going into the workplace wise do you think that in any way COVID has sort of changed our outlook where we are going back into the workplace but maybe we want to sort of up our appearance because we're going back out again or being on tv or celebrities like do you think there's any difference from pre-COVID-19 till now or do you think it didn't really affect it no it definitely did definitely did I mean everything you know because people were stuck at home for right. you know, a couple of years so everybody was just comfortable and I don't know if you've seen any of Kevin you know Kevin O'Leary who's yes on, Mr. So Wonderful have you seen any of his videos where he's like he'll be you know in front of the camera with a, a suit jacket a shirt and tie on and a pair of Bermuda shorts on you know below because you won't see the shorts so I think yeah I think the pandemic definitely affected a lot of people you know everybody wanted to feel you know they were at home so they didn't want to wear a suit at home and even now that you know people have gone going back to the office slowly but surely, um, tailoring's got a lot more a lot softer. People are wearing suits again, but it's a lot of a, it's a much softer constructed suit. 
Here's an American Idol question. I think I know your answer, but I'm kind of curious to hear what you have to say. So people always made fun of Simon because he wore the same thing and he didn't really get dressed up, you know, kind of not unlike Ryan would always wear a suit. Um, you're just showing up in his T-shirts. What's your take on that? Because I kind of think I know what you're going to say, but what do you think? Well, for two things. One, Simon was, you know, a brand. That's him just reinforcing the brand. It's like, it's, it's, um, it's like you know, sort of Jay Leno. He literally, you know, when he's off camera, he just wears a denim shirt, jeans, same denim shirt, jeans, all year round. Um, Barack Obama, he, he most 90% of the time he was a president, he just wore a gray suit with a white shirt. And it's just one of the people do it just to kind of one thing. One reason is to reinforce a brand. Another is to it's for busy people is one less thing they have to think about during the day. So that the energy from that thought goes into something else, something that makes things more productive for them. But on a note on Simon's T-shirt, Simon's T-shirts were Armani that were like a thousand bucks a piece. Ah. And he'd have the collars trimmed specifically to a certain thickness. So it showed a certain amount of, you know, his, chest hair <laughs> i i thought you were gonna say that well he's comfortable so there you, you know <laughs> <laughs> but simon simon's I, I actually really i have a lot of respect for simon and it's funny my wife and i were talking about it the other day because it must be an english treat trait because i'm kind of quite direct and simon was you know praised and chastised for being direct on the show and my wife's working with an English, another English guy at the minute who she said is a doctor who's very direct. But I, li- I like it when people are direct, it's especially, you know, in my job. If I'm showing an, a client something and they're like, well, yeah, maybe, no, yeah, I could maybe, but like, no, just tell me if you like it or not, then we can move on. We've got, you know, plenty of other things to do. So, you yeah. know, I much prefer when people are uh, direct and say, you know, yes, love it, no, hate it. And kind of, let's move on. That makes sense. It's like they've paid you to help them with their sartorial needs. You might as well, they might as well be honest with you, right? If they yeah, don't like No, something. exactly. And it's, you know, but again, like that goes back to Simon as well. He was like, yep, yeah, love it. No, hate you. Get off. <laughs> you know, it's, that, it's, that, it's that kind of same thing. It's like, let's just move on. Let's, and it made for good TV as well. Fantastic television. A few other names in mind that I had from Idol Miles. One, of course, is Carrie Underwood. Talk about a transformation. What do you remember oh, yeah. about Carrie? Well, when Carrie came to the show, she'd never been on a plane before. That was the first time she'd ever been on a plane. She's literally spent her life in, you know, dungarees. So when we started kind of transforming her, again, she had to be a really gentle transformation because she would bulk at everything, everything because she was like, she was so shy and quiet. And it was kind of really about gaining her trust and saying, no, you look great in this. And, you know, it's going to look amazing on camera and your voice is just going to do the rest. Towards the end of the season, um, we went shopping and I bought her a pair of, on the budget, Jimmy Choo shoes, which at the time was sort of like 650 bucks or something. And she was like, I'm never spending that much on shoes. And I said, you know, I've got, to, I'll bet you a hundred bucks within two years, you've got a hundred pairs in your closet. Wow. Still hasn't paid me. <laughs> I mean, you look at her on stage at all these different award shows and things. It's great. I mean, she, transformation yet again. Yeah. What about Chris Daughtry? Daughtry was great. Daughtry was another one like Danny Gogi. He knew exactly what he wanted. Daughtry was actually probably the pickiest contestant I've ever worked with. Mm. I get I'm really well with Chris, but he was really picky about things. <laughs> but you know, again, it's I can't sort of knock him for it because he knew how he wanted to be presented. But he was very, very finicky about the fit of things. Wow. But he was a good he's a good guy, Chris. I like him a lot. And he's been through a lot as well. I know. Jennifer Hudson. She let us do what we wanted to do, and then there was one dress that she picked out herself. Of, Pepto-Bismol dress. I don't know if you remember that dress. I don't know. Hmm, I'm like trying to think of her. Pepto-Bismol. And she got chastised for that as well, which was... But she, I mean, yeah, Jennifer, again, she's just gone on to massive things. Um, and again, it's like, you know, she, you know, she milked Idol for what, for, you know, all it was worth. She, it was, it gave her a leg up and go, look at where she is now. I know. It's surreal seeing her and Kelly Clarkson hosting their own talk shows. Yeah. Like they have their own set, you know, their own soundstage, whereas they would be a contestant filling up stage 36 at CBS and now Red Studios. I mean, now they're like own a whole stage. It's it's amazing. Yeah. 
No, Kelly's great. I mean, Kelly's so lovely. I, don't, I haven't seen, I don't see Jennifer very often, but she's uh-huh. so nice when I see her. Most, it's, it's funny because, like, I, especially back in, you know, the first four or five seasons, Idol was like real kind of camaraderie. Everybody kind of looked out for everybody else. And I guess I mean, maybe they still do. I don't know. But, you know, when I was working with the contestants, everybody took care of everybody and looked after everybody else. And, you know, everyone became family. So, you know, when you see people after five or six years, it's like kind of catching up with an old friend again or, you know, an old, a long less sibling. People, contestants I've interviewed have described Idol like camp. And, you know, back in the early days, it was longer than camp. I mean, it was like going away for it was like going to boarding school. If you look at the length of time, you're like going away for a year with these people. I mean, I think that probably creates the certain bond. And then, as you said, sort of alumni will look out for each other even if they didn't compete on the same season. Right. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, a lot of, you know, everyone who's been through it, they realize it's, I mean, I is an amazing show to go through, but it's tough. I mean, it's physically draining, it's emotionally draining. I mean, I always said to every contestant, just, you know, if you get 10 minutes to sleep and take a nap, take a nap. Because, you know, they do, they do work you and you've got, you know, constant rehearsals, you've got, you know, when I, you know, me taking them shopping, you've got producers doing interviews, You've got vocal coaches, and then you've actually got to figure out, you know, the live set as well. So it's bizarre to just like imagine to think about. Imagine if social media existed in the first five. It really came on like I don't know, season ten, eleven. Just imagine if we had Instagram and TikTok and Twitter in those yeah. early seasons, because then you would have that to take care of. Because you know now yeah. social media, there's no excuses. That has to be a part of your. It's almost like in the way that interviews and you know, those Ford music videos were really a part of your downtime. Now it's like, we got to shoot a Instagram story. We got to do, cause this is, and then with that comes all the opinions online. It's like people online are the judges now because there's opinions yeah. and they're dealing with all kinds of stuff, getting outside of fashion. It's like, well, they can judge their, their, their style, but just man, if, if it, if it existed back then, I mean, that would just add a whole nother layer to yeah, the intensity. No, it's, you know, I mean, the whole social media thing, I don't, well, you know, it's, I have a love hate relationship with it, but you know, it's, yeah, it's just such an added pressure for people nowadays, especially, you know, some of the younger contestants, because, you know, they obviously, they're well versed in it, but it's just, you know, there's a lot of keyboard warriors, people who can oh, yeah. say pretty nasty things from behind their keyboards. I think if we keep bringing it back, I, I I just, I mean, I love that the first thing you said was comfort is the most important thing. When you are a stylist and when someone's choosing an outfit and, and actually interestingly with, with social media, people judging and having opinions about it, it's like, it really doesn't matter at the end of the day what they think, what the Instagram comments think. And if you're comfortable in what you're wearing and you think it looks good, right? Just block out all the noise, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, just own it. I mean, that's that's the thing is like owning what you wear. If you if you're kind of going to go out on stage wearing something that you've kind of chosen or that you like to wear, then you just got to own it and get out there and say, okay, this is me. Take it or leave it. That's got to put you in an interesting position because it's like when everybody is praising the work that you've done, it's like, oh my gosh. If it's a positive, we love that they're making these comments. If it's a negative, they need to get on with their lives and not spend so much time obsessing over these outfits and and saying. Yeah. But people do. They have nothing well, better to do. Like, I could say I'm kind of quite direct. So I've had people commenting on outfits and I'm just like, can you send me a picture of what you're wearing so I can critique that? And maybe that's me being a little petty and I shouldn't really do that. But I don't think it's fair for people to kind of comment like behind to, unless they're going to back it up with something. Very true. So when you work on the show now with Ryan, are you starting from the auditions? Do you mainly come in at the live shows? No, I mean, auditions, we go out. We're going out in a couple of weeks, actually. Uh huh. The first of the foot to start the auditions. So yeah, no, I can attend if I don't actually if I actually can't go on to the auditions, then I'll send clothes for him. I've got to miss a couple of cities this time because I've, I'm doing. You know, I dress Alfonso Ribeiro. He's doing Dancing with the Stars and he's hosting it this year. So you know, there are days that clash so I, that I have to be in the studio with him. So send Ryan with a little suitcase. And he must have developed a passion for style, just like you said, meeting him, not knowing what kind of star he would become. I think, you know, this sort of stuff evolves, you know, you're a television host and you're like, oh, I want to get involved in this. And it kind of is probably interesting to be a part of that journey. Yeah. I mean, Ryan, 
Ryan loves clothes. He loves clothes when it's for his personal wardrobe. When when he when I have to do a fitting for Idol or something, I get it. You know, five minutes to try and figure everything out and pin it and get it up to the tailor. When it's um, for his personal wardrobe, he's like, "Take your time. Let's try this. Let's try that. Let's try this." It's just fun. I, I, I love doing his personal stuff because you know, then I get then we get to have like you know, spend time together and have a lot of fun. Because he's a really fun guy. He's a really, really nice guy, Ryan. Even for the live show, he'll be there on his phone like this while I'm tying his tie in between. So we've learned how to kind of maneuver around each other. So, you know, I can get him out out there on time and he can get his business finished. Ever any crazy things happen during a live show where you have to step in and, oh my gosh, what are we going to do if something happens with wardrobe? Oh, did you not see the whole thing? Oh, I did. (laughs) All over the press. (laughs) And they weren't my underwear. I had a spare pair for him in my kit. Yes, that I'm. I'm glad we heard that detail. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, he milked that. That was so funny. And I kind of, you know, I don't know if I can say it on this podcast, but the New York Post had a headline saying "Penis Panic at American Idol." Oh my god! Yeah, it was all. It was so funny because it's the finale. Someone had just won the show, and all that we're seeing in the news. <laughs> I know it was that. Was, it was funny. I, we had a laugh about that, but then yeah, but when he went, I couldn't believe he went on the you know Kelly and Ryan show the next day and said that. I was mortified, and <laughs> then my phone and my email and my Instagram and everything just started blowing up, saying you didn't, you didn't. My mum calling me from England, you did not give Ryan your underwear. <laughs> oh my gosh! So that's it. You're the first people to hear it. it wasn't my underwear. Well, still, you're a hero. You stepped in with your spare. And exactly. working in television, working with people who host television and going back to being 11 years old, falling in love with it. I mean, what has ever maybe surprised you about this journey you've been on? Was it always in the cards for you where you thought maybe I'd love to work with celebrities and, and go on TV show sets? I mean, was that something you'd always thought? Not at kid? all. No, no. I mean, my career, I've been very, very fortunate. And I've kind of, I mean, some of it's being in the right place at the right time. Uh-huh. Um, I've always been really into clothes and style, not necessarily fashion, but yeah, I've just kind of like, I've had a very, very lucky life in, in the fact that I've been in, you know, offered certain things throughout my career that just kind of like it's snowballed and become a whole different life. I've had like three or four different lives. I mean, I kind of, I toured with bands for a while as well, doing wardrobe, but I never met, I made some amazing friends along the way. I got to work with some amazing, amazing people and, you know, not even just contestants, but, you know, we'd have, you know, designers like Badgley Mishka came in and we designed um, Jordan Sparks' finale dress, which, you know, she, Jordan was like, she felt like a princess. And at the time, they, you know, Badgley Mishka were just like, you know, one of the biggest names in fashion. So it was kind of a huge coup. And then we had, you know, everything from, you know, Ed Hardy and Christian Odege, like letting all the kids raid the warehouse and it was crazy for a lot of people we just we literally just throw whatever you want come in grab it grab whatever you want for yourself for the contestants for your family for your mother for your grandmother it's, it's like charlie and the chocolate factory you it just come was, in and yeah. get all the chocolate you want yeah, get what you want it's crazy you have your golden ticket no uh, yeah it definitely was a golden ticket for a long while a hit making factory that show you know money machine well that was the other thing i wanted to say as well is like you know it's even with all of these other shows that are on, it's, I mean, I'm not going to name any of the shows, but can you name any of the winners on any of the other singing shows? You'd be surprised at how many of the idols who you don't hear about actually have really, really good careers. One of the highlights of my contestant interviewing journey was meeting a man named Chris Medina. I don't know if you would have met him because he didn't make the live shows. No, it wasn't, it wasn't the guy with the big curly hair, was it? Yes. He made it to right before the live shows, actually. Uh, Jennifer Lopez's first season and Steven Tyler, so season 10. And his fiance at the time had been in a car accident. Coming off of the show, he had met the producer Rodney Jerkins, Dark Child, because at the time Jimmy Iovine was, you know, he was running the music department and he was the in-house mentor and he had his whole team of superstar producers. So Dark Child had heard about Chris and wanted to work with him, even though he hadn't made it that far. And they co-wrote and produced a song about what he went through to this day it's 13 years later 70 million records and he's also a huge star norway which is where he lives now right the single to this day has been able to pay for everything he's he's no longer with this woman 
but everything she needs, physical therapy, uh, medicine, anything you could think of that she just needs to stay alive and well, that song is still paying for. Wow, that's amazing. I spoke with William Hung the other day and he's a motivational speaker. So you go on YouTube, right. the guy's done 10 different TED Talks. You don't have to get the golden ticket. No, exactly. Yeah, I mean... I mean, also, uh, you know, remember Jacob Lusk? Have you seen? Have you heard about his he, uh, what are the Gabriels? Right, that's Gabriel, what it's called. Yeah, I mean, they're amazing. Ah, oh. and they're massive in Europe. There's a radio station called KCRW in LA, which there's a station that broke Coldplay, and I mean, pretty much every major band it broke, but more kind of slot on the, on an indie side of thing, on the indie side of things. But they've been championing Jacob, and it's like they played Glastonbury last year. They I mean, he's he's done really, really well. Michaela Gordon. Yeah, you should get Michaela on. Michaela's great. Oh, and she, well, she she has her own. I don't. Is she still hosting? She had her own uh, radio show. I know. I think yeah, she I, know she did, I don't know if she still does, but she's she's fantastic. She's got a great she's, personality. Uh, yeah, she really, really is. And that's you know the other thing about Idol is that they always cared about personality because you know there's sort of that line where you have to be able to sing, but you also have to be able to connect. Carrie was still that country girl from back home. Michaela still had that same personality. And interesting for you to get to work with them and kind of watch their style of all. But the fact that these kids were people that we could relate to, I think that probably is another key ingredient, right? Yeah. And then, you know, yeah, then there's people like um, Kim Caldwell as well, who, you know, she went on, she was a presenter and amazing careers going for themselves still. Clay and Ruben were both at the Idol finale last season. And it was so nice to see the pair of them. It was a brilliant finale, by the way. Honestly, my yeah. favorite finale since Adam Lambert's finale. Right. Yeah, I mean, things like the fina- the finales were a com- when we- when I was doing the finales, the contestants, the quick changes we had to do were insane. And you know, one thing with like Clay and Ruben, I mean, that was my first year, and that was you know, Ruben being a bigger guy then took time to change, and Clay and I were both actually changing Ruben. Mm-hmm. at the same time oh. they was helping me wow did you ever after or in commercial breaks i don't know if you ever spent time with the judges met them whatever but I, you mentioned simon um he would have these direct opinions about their fashion would you ever kind of have a laugh with them in commercials or after the show and you know they'd chat with you and say oh we thought this about this person's outfit oh yeah yeah oh, yeah all the time and simon would be like you know i didn't mean it darling and then, you know, Randy, oh, Randy was lovely as well. I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, some of the judges I didn't really have too much contact with, like sort of Nicki Minaj and Mariah Carey, didn't really have much contact with them. Um, Keith Urban was and Harry Connick were both amazing, such nice guys. And J-Lo was great. And then now, I mean, I, I haven't really kind of talked to Katie very, very much, but Lionel's one of the nicest guys on the planet. And Luke's just, you know, Luke, Luke's, you know, the big kind of country guy. He's like, and he is, he's like he is on stage. It was wild being there again, just being in the crowd and seeing, seeing the whole operation. Well, the way the judges are and, and the way the contestants and Ryan, it, it, it's must be fun to get to go and see that live show every week and then be backstage and be such an integral part of that production. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, and it's live TV's the TV is the best because when it's taped, it can take hours. There's no room for error, so it's kind of it keeps people on their toes a little bit more. Which is why the Ryan underwear thing was quite kind of fun as well, because you know we had like a three minute break to go and deal with all of that. Right. Any advice for somebody who? Well, a, a few kind of subcategories here. Somebody who wants to follow in your footsteps, be a stylist what would you say to them if they're looking for just a place to start? If you want to be a stylist, I would reach out to, there's there's plenty of styling agencies who basically, you know, are managers for stylists. I would assist someone or as many people as you can. I'd reach out to photographers and just start, even if it's your own clothes or other, you know, you borrow clothes from whoever, start taking pictures with a model or your friends. Um, and, just climb the ladder that way. I mean, that's how I did it. And I think that's the best way. I think it's experience is really, really important. There's a lot of people out there now who think they can be stylist because, you know, they've got, you know, wealthy family and they're using daddy's credit card for want of a better term. And, you know, they said, you know, they think they go, they think they can shop for themselves or they can shop for anybody else. And it's, you know, there's a bit more to it than that. It's kind of learning, 
the little kind of subtle nuances of people and making people feel comfortable and not pushing yourself on other people too much. For someone who's trying to find their personal style, who is just hasn't really maybe figured out that look, what would you say to them? Um, try different things. Try and find what suits your body shape um, and find a true friend who will give you the honest answer. The Simon answer. Exactly. A lot of friends say, yeah, you look great. You look great. And they are your friends still, but you want that friend, one friend will say, no, it doesn't look good. But they have, they have to say why as well and not just say, you look terrible. You have to say, well, it doesn't see you here. It doesn't, you know. You need to learn to kind of hide your flaws and if you have any flaws. Do you think some of it is instinct? Like when we when we have that friend or that relative who knows how to be Simon with us and maybe we don't know how to tailor a suit or what fits perfectly, but we just get a glance of something. Do you think the instinct is a part of that without even being a style expert where we just like have that first look and we're like, oh, this might not look good. Because Simon's not a style expert, right? I mean, you know, we just have opinions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I never, to be honest with you, I never really took Simon's... um fashion advice for the contestants <laughs> too seriously. Right. Um, but yeah, I, th- I think that, I definitely think you have to have an instinct for clothes to mm-hmm. what looks good on people. I mean, I've made mistakes. Every, you know, every, you know, you have to make mistakes to kind of figure out the right way. Just, you know, I try not to do it in front of, you know, 28 million people. <laughs> yeah. That's such a crazy experience. Cause you're, you know, you, do you ever get lost in the fact that everybody's tuning in or are you sort of oh, hyper aware of it? Like, did you, start to fixate on the fact that you're styling people that are going to be seen by all these people no i never did it's really weird i never did it's just you know kind of they were my focus the people were my focus and not i mean there's a lot of stylists who kind of gone on and done other things i mean i made a choice to stay behind the camera I, i was offered my wife and i were offered a couple of tv shows ourselves and i was offered other shows for myself and i was just like no i don't want to do that you know i'm quite happy just being behind the camera and staying in the background I think, you know, it's, and I didn't, I never wanted that red carpet moment. I never wanted to have, you know, a celebrity on the red carpet and, you know, kind of the stylist getting, be the stylist getting all the awards. I'm just, you know, I'm quite happy just to put people out there and hopefully people will like what they see. Yeah. And I was going to ask you just advice you have from what you've learned from television and and music and things like that. The one thing about Ryan, he'll go, he'll walk around and say hi to every member of the crew. Some people don't do that. Um, and that's, I learned a lot from Ryan in that, you know, it's, you know, you've got to be nice to everyone because you never know, like that guy who's the PA could be your next executive. And it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't take it, you know, cost you anything to be nice to people. You all are a part of TV history. It's crazy. I mean, Idol was, and I don't know if it still is, but it was the biggest ever, biggest show on TV and, and the biggest show in television history. You know, more people voted for Idol than they did for George Bush. <laughs> You know, I think that's important. I think whatever people want to say about it, oh, like not as many people, not as many people watch it. I really don't. You think it's like the model for reality? Obviously, it's a gold standard, but it the fact that it made such a big impact on the country, the world. I mean, you have Idol Gives Back, which is literally helping people across the world. You have the way it brought people together. We haven't has anything really united <laughs> the country since American Idol. It's like it just you know. Everybody could get together and say, yeah, that no, exactly. Something. I mean, you know, there's a, there's also there's you know there there are those staples like you know Price is Right, and right, game shows, Deputy, and those kind of game shows that people and you know I work on Price is Right and I never realized that so many people watch it. Yeah, rest in peace to Bob Maybe, Barker. Most people way. I knew kind of like, wow, I grew up watching that show. It's like, wow, yeah, I never thought it was. <laughs> um, but the, there is one other thing that I wanted to say as well is you know for as far as being a stylist whether it's for tv or for whatever you have to have an opinion but you have to know when not to force your opinion on somebody so you know you need to kind of know when you can when, to, when if someone's kind of like pushing back you need to know when to step back and say okay no matter how wrong you think they might be but you know it's just that's one of the ways you kind of keep on getting the repeat work in this business is listening to people but also having an opinion and saying that look you know i think you should do this it's got to be tough when you have those instincts, but I guess it's their instincts too. They're the ones wearing the clothes. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, but other people, you know, everyone's become, especially nowadays, everybody's become, with social media, everybody's become so image conscious that it's, you know, it's, they know they're going to be picked apart. So I don't envy people being on camera nowadays. Right. 
Would you like to plug your social media or your website or anything coming up from you? My my social media is not really kind of I'm like I'm not <laughs> Instagram thing. I'm much more. I, I like taking photographs, so I kind of like half of my social media, half of my, half of my Instagram feed is my own photographs. I'll occasionally post some work stuff, but not that often. Well, they must be great photos. I mean, it's just miles and I don't even know what it is, my Instagram. <laughs> we'll put it on the screen in case you didn't get yeah, it right. Mr. Miles underscore Siggins, I think. Love it. And Miles, I can't thank you enough for being a part of the show. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it.